All right, again, again I'm Brian Dougherty. I'm a uh, Safe Routes to School coordinator with the uh, Seattle Department of Transportation. I actually, there's not very many unfamiliar faces or, or names, at least, in, in the crowd. But I am going to start the presentation off assuming that you know nothing about Safe Routes to School and, and why it's important. I'll go through it fairly quickly, though, so I don't bore you all to tears. Um, and I just noticed as I was standing in the back of the room that um, I, I forgot to change the stock template uh, photo for my presentation, but uh, it's, imagine it's Bailey Gatzert, actually, because Yes or Terrace isn't going to be that different from that scene once that uh, new development is constructed, and um, it's going to be a challenge, but also very pedestrian-oriented, so hopefully lots of kids will be walking to school there. Um, a little slow because I broke my arm on my bicycle, so... Uh, safe routes for <laughs> safe routes to school are safe routes for everyone. I like to say that. So I just always have to go through what the mission of the department is, and um, Robin, we have five Robin. core values. At the top of that is safety, and that's where safe routes to school clearly lives um, at the top of the list of our five core values at the Seattle Department of Transportation. I'm going to talk about what safe routes to school is our prioritization process, because as Kathy mentioned, there are almost an un endless amount of need throughout the city. There are approximately 100 public schools in the city and then another 100 private schools. And you can imagine every parent who sends their child every day to those schools thinks it's the most important. So we have to find a way to prioritize our limited resources. Um, and so I'll talk about how we do that. Um, we're going to talk about walking audits because one of the things that I want to give you tonight is some tools to go back to your neighborhoods and your schools so that you can help us prioritize what the most important investments would be at your school and then I can help you identify other funding sources to kind of chip away at those top needs. And then traffic circulation plans. Actually this is a little bit of a, a, um, a miss on my part. This is brand new. We have a pick up and drop off um, guide to help people um, analyze traffic circulation around schools and then develop improvements. When I went to print it out, it wasn't formatted correctly, so I had to have our graphic artist work on reformatting it so that it can actually be printed. Um, but what I'll do is after the, after, the, after the workshop, I'll send it to everybody to make sure you sign up in, on the sign up sheet. I'll send it to you electronically and then you can print it at home if uh, you're able to do that. And then, like I said, I'll give you some funding options and some ideas. So, Safe Routes to School isn't just engineering improvements. It's actually five uh, different components that all try to work together. Engineering is one of them, so making physical improvements to the walking and biking routes to school. Education, so that we give kids the knowledge and the skills that they can walk and bike safely to school. Encouragement, so that we are uh, supporting and have a supportive environment for kids walking and biking. The more kids walking and biking, the fewer cars there are going to be at the, competing for that front door of the school. So that helps solve the traffic chaos that we see at almost every school in, in the city. Uh, enforcement, so we want to get the police out there to provide enforcement. That's speed enforcement, crosswalk enforcement, and then parking enforcement. I'm sure you've all seen the parking chaos that goes on, and uh, yeah, exactly. Isn't that how we met initially? Well, I think we were at Walk Bike School. Okay, we yeah. Met, and then, I mean, I've had a lady, we've been going to the same school for preschool too, so. Okay. Like some lady was tailing a taxi through, and I was already in the intersection, and she cut me off. Um, WQY six six zero. Yeah, I think probably somewhere in there. I think so. I think so. <laughs> or with cars, either way. And then evaluation, because we want to make sure that that what we're doing is working. That we want to make sure that we're reducing risk to kids as they're walking and biking to school, and we want to make sure that we're actually increasing the number of kids walking and biking to school. In 1969, about half of kids walked and biked to school nationwide, and now it's somewhere around 15%. It's pretty abysmal nationwide. In Seattle, it's about 27%, so we're better than the average. And it's actually gone up pretty considerably. And I won't say that I had anything to do with it. It's a combination 
of the school district going back to neighborhood schools primarily. And then also the uh, someone mentioned the cuts to yellow bus service. Um, mm -hmm. So what we found with the cuts to yellow bus service is it's about half and half um, in terms of what, what families des decide. About half of families have decided to drive, which has made the traffic chaos around schools just much, so much worse. And then about half are walking and or biking to school instead. So um, a lot of work to do, but at least we're trending in the right direction. Um, and like I said, that um, has un unintended consequences when you have, in some cases, half of kids arriving in single occupancy vehicles, it just creates a traffic nightmare for the entire neighborhood. So what we want to do is, again, make improvements to the walking and biking routes to school so that parents feel comfortable letting their kids walk and bike, so that there are fewer cars around the schools, so that we solve that traffic mess and get kids active. It's all part of um, uh, better health for kids. When kids walk and bike to school, they're, they're more um, alert in the morning. Research has shown they actually are ready to learn when they arrive if they've walked and biked to school. So it has multiple benefits. I talked about this already. I'm going to breeze over it. Again, this is the five E's that we focus on. No one individual element of the program by itself is probably going to solve the problem, but all of them together um, work sort of as a in harmony and um, SDOT funds pieces of all of those five E's. This is impossible to see, <laughs> but what I wanted to show you is that, and I've got a handout that you can actually see and a list of schools. Kathy mentioned that we have a new uh, <coughs> school five-year action plan. And um, so the five-year action plan includes a prioritization process that we're going to refresh every year because, as you have heard, the school district is opening new schools every year, and they plan to continue to do that um, for the next five years. So every year we'll rerun this prioritization process. It takes into account the, C the city's pedestrian master plan data, which looks at the connectivity of the pedestrian network. It also has an equity component, so schools that have high percent of minority students get ranked higher. And I can talk about that in a little bit more depth, but basically, in neighborhoods that have high percent of minority students, the city has historically underinvested in infrastructure, and we want to kind of reverse that. Um, and also, um, the city has a race and social equity policy, um, so we're intentionally redirecting resources to neighborhoods that have been traditionally underserved. Um, and we've, we've got it ranked by along the roadway. So as you know, north of 85th Street essentially has no sidewalks. So they have a certain type of need, but then the central district has different types of needs. Their, their needs are more based on crossings. Um, and so we prioritize both sets along the roadway and, and across the roadway. So how we're able to do what we're able to do is primarily because of the photo enforcement that we have in the school zones, which started in 2012. Um, anybody not familiar with the photo enforcement of the speed limits? No. Everyone's familiar. All that money that we gather from those photo enforced speed zones goes directly into the Safe Routes to School program to make physical improvements to make it safer and easier for kids to walk and bike to school. It also pays for education programs. Uh, one really exciting one that we've got started is that we're going to fund a bicycle and pedestrian safety education program that's going to reach every single public elementary school in the district next year. So right now there's only bicycle education at about half of the public schools. Mm. So we're going to double that and then we're going to add a pedestrian education component to it. So. That is really exciting. Is the bicycle safety education from the city of Seattle or we or are paying? Or? We are paying the um, city of Seattle is paying the school district, and then the school district is going to contract with Cascade Bicycle Club. Oh. But anyways, this map shows where all the speed cameras are located, and about four million dollars of a year comes from the speed cameras. 
about a million dollars comes from the local transportation levy, and then we get grants also from the state and federal government. So the total amount that we have to spend citywide is about $6 million a year, which is, like Kathy mentioned, sort of a, a pittance, especially compared with the fact that we have about 200 schools, all of which are crying out for improvements. Are those cameras fixed infrastructure, or are they movable from school to school? We have both. So the ones that are, were shown on that map are uh, fixed infrastructure. They have embedded loops in the pavement that measure speed. We also have a mobile um, speed enforcement van with, that can go to um, certain schools. It, it, there's technical requirements about where it can be placed. Um, it goes to schools like BF Day and Our Lady of Guadalupe. There's a handful of schools where it can technically be used. So, Is there any plan or process for expanding fixed infrastructure to additional schools, or is the program? Yep, we just added um, six more schools last month. When would you like questions? <laughs> it would be great if you could hold questions, questions till the end. Great. So, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Outreach and education, again, is a component of safe routes to school. We can do things like play streets, where you temporarily <laughs> close off a street to do games and activities. Um, walk and bike to school events. This is, uh, on, on the right is um, at uh, Top Pot Donuts at, at Bryant Bike to School Day. Bicycle rodeos on school playgrounds and walk to school day events. We've also got the ability to, so again, if, you're, if your school doesn't rank at the top for our Safe Routes to School program, there are other things that we can look at. Um, so again, the prioritization process is prioritizing the big capital projects. So like when we're digging up the street and we're putting in new sidewalks. But we actually have some new tools at our disposal just in the past couple of years that are pretty exciting. Um, well, the flags aren't new. That they're five years old but you, you know we've got the ability to um, no permit you don't need a permit you can just put pedestrian crossing flags at crosswalks whether they're marked or unmarked signalized or not signalized but on the right um, this is at, at Lowell Elementary School on 12th Avenue and we were looking at the possibility of doing curb extensions which shorten the pedestrian crossing distance and make the crosswalks safer but it costs oodles of money to do that because you have to relocate the drainage and concrete work costs a lot of money. But now we can do it in paint with some bollards which is just great because it makes it a lot cheaper and we can do it really quickly. From the moment I say this is a good idea to that actually happening is like two months as opposed to years and hundreds of thousands of dollars. We can also, uh, you need to get a permit to do it, but you can also do a painted intersection if you're uh, in a neighborhood street. So not on arterials, not on the busy streets, um, at least not yet. But you can do painted intersections on non-arterial streets, which a lot of people say helps to slow down traffic. It certainly adds some aesthetic, and it also brings neighborhoods together um, to provide some community building and then colored crosswalks. I probably shouldn't have included that, but there is gonna be an official program where communities can do colored crosswalks. There's gonna be some parameters, but it's gonna be an official program. Can they do colored crosswalks at our tables? Yes, I think so. Awesome. Walking school, somebody mentioned walking school bus, so the idea is, yep. Okay, yeah, yeah, you might, that's right. Walking school bus, the idea is that kids walk as a group with an adult leader. Um, it makes parents a lot more comfortable. There's some consistency that's provided, and um, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, usually parent volunteers, but we could also potentially use college students, stipends, incentives. And then paint, good old painted crosswalks. So. Um, some technical challenges to overcome, but if you've got at least 10 kids crossing in the morning and the afternoon, we can mark a crosswalk. It's pretty simple. Yeah. Just like on a regular neighborhood street? You know, we don't do them on the regular neighborhood streets very okay. much, just because the, we, we focus on the areas where there's the most conflict, and what we find is most pedestrian collisions happen on the arterial streets. So we. 
Um, and you probably have noticed that we can't keep up with the maintenance of the crosswalks mm -hmm. that we already do have. So rather than sprinkle them like candy all over the city, we're really focusing them on the arterial crossings, unless it's right next to the school. If it's really right next to the school, um, we could potentially mark them. We just marked a whole bunch at Jane Adams. So I just want to understand it. So on an arterial like Third Avenue, you could paint a crosswalk as long as kids like Third and Sixty Second, for example, where there's ten kids crossing daily. You cannot, but I mean, you can. <laughs> I can. I would. <laughs> <laughs> so Brian, oh. what's the? I mean, how long is the process of like getting you out there to count the kids crossing to get them on the road? Um, the counts are done. We have a data and records group that goes out and does the counts. It has to. It can't just be like. You went out there and saw 10 kids, and then I say, okay. It has to be an official count, and we do it with video. Um, and that there's a queue, right? So you have to get in queue, and then they go out and do the count. That takes a, sometimes a couple months. And then the results come back, and if it's good, then I say mark the crosswalk, and it happens in another couple months. So it, it is a little bit of a, a wait, but um, it can happen fairly quickly. Speed humps, I'll talk about the effectiveness of speed humps um, in a second. I think we're all pretty familiar with what they are. They um, slow down cars um, with some uh, vertical um, bump. Yeah, exactly. It's a bump. And then raised crosswalks are very much the same thing. They have more of a raised tabletop, and then the crosswalk is marked on top of it. But again, it's got the, um, the bump to slow cars down. And Here's, um, we've been taking a look to see if speed pumps and um, race crosswalks are effective, and what we found is that they're extremely effective. So focus on, um, focus especially on the bottom, but the top is also interesting. So these are um, all in school zones where we installed speed pumps, and it's before and after. Um, so the percent of people who were going more than 25 went down between 80 and 90 percent. And the percent of drivers who went, who went down, who were above 35 went down from, again, 80 to, to 90 percent. So that has a huge impact on safety. If you're, you probably, most of us have probably heard, or uh, many of us have heard, that if you're hit by a car as a pedestrian at 30 or 40, you have a pretty good chance of, of um, dying, unfortunately. If you're hit by a car at 20, you have a really good chance of being injured. You don't want it to happen, but you have a really good chance of surviving. So the, the slower cars go around school zones, the safer it is. It's just for, for everybody. And then focusing on, again on the arterial crossings, I heard numerous times concerns about crossing the busy streets. And so we want to make that easier with things like curb extensions and always stops and clearly marked crosswalks, and signals and flashing lights. We want the sidewalks to be accessible, so we do curb ramps, which aren't super sexy, but they're very functional. New sidewalks, which are super expensive. Um, <clears throat> even sort of low cost option sidewalks are about 200,000 a block and if you do it the old fashioned way like this with drainage and planting strips and street trees and the whole shebang it's more like 400,000 a block so super super expensive and then I want to talk a little bit about some of the resources that will provide you that will help us so when we when we focus on a school the first thing we do is gather together a team, a Safe Routes to School team. These are people like neighbors and parents and school staff who are interested in traffic safety. A lot of schools already have this committee uh, it's at some function or another. And you go out and you literally decide what the route is as, as a committee and you walk and bike the critical routes to school and you identify systematically what's wrong with the infrastructure, what needs to be fixed, and what the prioritization is. And I've got with me a walkability and bikeability checklist that I'm going to give you, as well as a one-page sheet that Mark Fenton, who's kind of a pedestrian expert, wrote um, 
giving you guidelines on how to conduct a walk, uh, walking audit. And so I would suggest that the, this one at the top, um, sort of a guideline, a lot of times people will come to us and they absolutely think that this is the solution. It's, it's often stop signs. I want a stop sign here. And then, you know, don't focus on that. Focus on cars are going too fast or cars aren't stopping for pedestrians. Because SDOT has um, a whole menu of options and I'm going to give you the engineering toolkit for safe routes to school which shows you what those options are. And often the best solution isn't the first one that you think it is. So often maybe speed humps are a better answer than a stop sign. Um, knowing who's responsible for what. So on a lot of walking audits what we'll do is if there's overgrown vegetation on the sidewalk, that's actually the responsibility in many cases of the adjacent property owner. So SDOT can't really do much about it. So contacting the property owner, um, which is kind of a, a <laughs> challenging thing to do. But again, knowing who's responsible for what, SDOT doesn't manage everything um, on the streets and sidewalks. And then implementing, implementing your plan. So there are things like mini grants. That's up to $1,000 that we can provide schools and community groups to do education and encouragement campaigns at schools. Neighborhood matching fund has been used in several cases. That, um, and there are several different levels of the neighborhood matching fund. You can get a mini, a, again, a mini grant for less than $1,000, I think it is. Um, there's one up to $20,000, and then there's one that goes up to, I think, $100,000. Um, so there's that $20,000 is especially a sweet spot because you can do things like really develop a, a professional plan and maybe even start to implement a, a little of it. Brian, you, you can use your mini grants for audits as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's different levels of audits. Um, and I was going to bring some examples with me, but I, I didn't have a chance to print them out. They can, they can range from just one page summaries, um, no graphics, or they can be multi-page, um, essentially plans that, that are put together by consultants. So it can, it can range the gamut of um, just bulleted item, prioritized bullet, bulleted items to a you know, really fully developed plan. Neighborhood Park and Street Fund uh, is going to be coming around. There are going to be calls for application um, probably in January. And people often use that as a way to get things like curb bulbs and curb ramps. You can get a project up to $90,000 funded through that mechanism. And you, there's a little bit of a process to go through. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> little is understandable. Yeah. But that is an option, and a lot of school groups have used that as a successful way to get their projects funded. The sidewalk development program, again, I mentioned, <clears throat> is super expensive. We are only able to build about 10 blocks of new sidewalk a year throughout the entire city. And the need is, you know, greatly um, outstrips what we can provide. So we've been recently talking about this idea of shared streets. Um, where maybe we don't have to build sidewalks on every street in the city. If we can just slow people down so that it feels more comfortable to walk and share the street uh, might be an option if you're not on the short-term sidewalk development plan. And then Kathy mentioned leveraging capital projects. And I'll give one really good example is the 23rd Avenue repaving project. Um, it was. It was very painful. I think we will all agree to go through the process, but what resulted was, I think, a really good model where the street is going to be narrowed and the sidewalks are going to be widened right in front of Garfield High School. Um, there's going to be a neighborhood greenway that's going to connect multiple schools. And so it, it really is up to you as advocates to, to keep the pressure on SDOT and to make sure you watch out for those big projects when they come along to make sure that we're really optimizing our resources and the right of way to make sure it's as safe as possible on the walking routes to school. Can I just chime in for a second too? And one tool that 
just came online this fall when the city council passed the resolution to put the move Seattle levy on the ballot. They also said that any project over a million dollars going through SDOT now needs to take into account the needs of St. Francis School. So it's not just you kind of banging on SS door, you're saying, hey, look, we actually have this resolution from council saying we need to be thinking about this. Are you thinking about it? Uh, so that's something we can use now. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's really good. That's really helpful. You mentioned the shared streets. Yeah. Um, is that something you can do on materials as well, or no? I wish, but no, I don't think that's, um, I don't think that I've ever seen uh, an example of a successful shared arterial street, just because uh, um, cars go so fast that it's, it's hard to say, you know, with cars going 35 miles an hour, that, so in that way, the, our sidewalk development program is really focused on the arterials. So again, that goes back to some of these streets and Cedar Park comes to mind. Um, we're never going to have the resources to build out the network of sidewalk on the residential non-arterial streets because we're really focused on, there's a lot of missing sidewalks on arterial streets. Streets that you wouldn't even imagine, like Greenwood Avenue and Aurora Avenue and 30th mm -hmm. Avenue Northeast. Um, so it's, it's daunting. How much of that backlog on materials does Move Seattle address? I don't know, actually, off the top of my head. I'm sorry. 150 blocks. 150. Okay. 150. I assume it would all be arterialization. But I'm, I'm curious how many arterial blocks of materials are missing. We uh, another good question. A lot. I mean, there's a lot, and it's all throughout the city. Right. Southeast, west. Um, I was just curious why there's such a high cost for sidewalk construction. Is it man hours, or what? What goes into the cost for? So it's a huge undertaking. It's actually much more complex when you realize that the way the adjacent property was developed was not developed with full infrastructure. So the, all the driveways are in the wrong place. All the <coughs> walls are in the wrong place. All the fences are in the wrong place. The drainage is in the wrong place utilities are in the wrong place. All of that has to get relocated. And then you, um, we had one that we did this summer near Sacagawea Elementary School where we built a, had to build a 10-foot retaining wall adjacent to a person's house, which adds tremendously to the cost. The roads, in especially north of 85th, when they were built, they weren't built in the center of the right-of-way. So sometimes they're way over to one side or way over to the other side. The road has to get straightened out as part of the sidewalk project. It, north of 85th Street also doesn't have any what you would consider modern drainage infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned 30th <laughs> Avenue North East. It has no conveyance system whatsoever. There's no, the water just sheets off the road and there's no place for it to go. So we have to build all that infrastructure as part of the sidewalk because we're putting in a curb. So otherwise, we'd be creating a lake. I've heard recently in our neighborhood that it's all just um, like blacktop. It's not actually <coughs> whatever road. yeah. concrete roads. Yep. It's just blacktop laid on top of gravel roads. Yep, that's correct. So okay. in, the, in the 60s and 70s, um, again, it's that north of 85th. Um, but there's also lots of other places in the city where this is the case. Um, there was a federal program to pay for paving streets, and so Seattle got a, a ton of money to do low-cost paving, which meant chip seal, um, which is a low-cost paving that okay. they just put right on top of the gravel. Yeah. And so there's a program to repave some of those streets, but yeah, they're really, really not built for heavy vehicles, certainly. Okay. Cool. Which is funny because heavy vehicles come by our time. All, yeah. That's all I just have. had a charter bus go through, you know, first that This is like the day after the Aurora incident, just to dump the boat. But, um, uh, but one of the things I wanted to mention is it's really expensive, but I think it's the wrong way to look at the problem. The way to look at, for example, the issue with the drainage is is really worthwhile to do something expensive like this because they're not only addressing a traffic and safety problem, they're also addressing the drainage problem. 
So it's, I mean, sure, it's expensive, but you're also getting more out of it. Absolutely. I didn't mean that to imply that it wasn't worth doing, just that it, it it's expensive, so we have to prioritize and really focus on the areas that are that are the greatest need and that have the greatest risk when you're walking. Um, so is the drainage, um, is the is the water issue a part of your prioritization assessment? Because, you know, puddles in the, in the sidewalks also prohibit children from walking. Absolutely. We do uh, look at that. Um, Northeast 110th Street has a horrible drainage problem that would be solved with sidewalks, so we prioritize that near John Rogers and and Jane Adams. I wanted to actually talk or ask about prioritization generally around the school zone. And I brought the Greenwood Elementary access map. So this is the school walk zone around Greenwood Elementary. And you and I actually worked on this together, Brian. Yeah. And you know, it has a lot of dots all over it, which are uh, places where people should use caution as they go on these <coughs> these these roads. And I'm just going to pass it around and just. Because I thought, it, and I don't know if I have enough for, for everyone, but I expect so many people, but, but what, you know, how would you approach that if you were, a par you know, a, a parent group going out and doing an assessment? I mean, one of the things that we've talked about is using those orange safety flags, which cost about $200 per intersection to kind of fully stop for a year or two. And you can do five of those with a mini grant. Yeah. And so that could be your mini grant. You can do choose five of these locations to put those those safety flags as your your safe routes to school mini grant. So so give us give us an example of, of how how you would do this. You know, how do you even approach your to like this? And, you know. you mean how you would prioritize? Yeah. How would that? you start? Even I mean, it's kind of daunting. Here you are, a parent group. You've never gone off and done an audit. And you want to get people to agree to do a, a safe routes to school prioritization project. Okay. Um, so basically, I would um, again start off by getting the committee together. So start off by meeting and getting <coughs> like this. You could use the school district attendance boundary, or you could use the um, S dot walk and bike maps, which are going to be up on our website here very shortly, and map out the areas as a committee that are your top concerns. And so they often are the arterial crossings, where there they might be places in the neighborhood where um, there have been collisions. You want to make sure that the walking route isn't too long. And I'll take this opportunity to hand out the guidelines that I mentioned earlier, because he does mention exactly what you should aim for in terms of this one. Now, the yellow area on that map is the school walk zone. Right, and there's not enough time during the, um, during the amount of time that you're likely to have the attention of a, a group of people, there's not enough time to visit every single corner on the map. Even on a bicycle. Even on a bicycle, exactly. And so you really need to focus on the areas that are of the greatest concern. They're often closest to the front door of the school, but not always. Um, they're typically the arterial crossings, and and it's helpful to go off and do this, you know, maybe with a group of two or three people, and then bring a larger group with you. Right, Kathy, do you want to talk about the process that you use? <laughs> 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 you do it too. I do it too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, it's, but it's very helpful to have kind of pre-identified some routes, pre-identified some some problem areas before you bring kind of the larger community along with you because everybody has their idea about this is the ideal route for me, this is the this is the intersection I have trouble with. Right. But you, what you want is a community consensus that will be the, the five places that you're going to put your crossing flags or the five areas that when that that big you know arterial project comes through your neighborhood that you can tap into and say these are the five places that we want to make you know, to get funding for safe routes to school in, in the future. We also have some veterans in the audience. Um, <laughs> Selene, you've led walking <laughs> audits before. Do you want to say anything that you've learned? Are we talking about the one recently with Kathy? No, I was thinking the one, one up at Whitman. Yeah, they did, um, 
we put together a similar committee. There was a, a parent a, a, with her son, and then Brian, and we had um, Thomas Livermore from the Department of Neighborhoods, some people from the Crown Hill Neighborhood Association, the Business Association. And we did this. The key was really to do it during school when the kids are getting out of school. Mm -hmm. Right. Ideally, when the middle school was getting out and right before the elementary school. So in that kind of like halfway time um, to really get a sense of how many kids are crossing Holden Road. Because there's only just, you know, there's, they cross and then they get on a bus and then they leave. But when you could see how many there are, and again, you see how they move in, in packs. <laughs> then you were, then it's just really, I mean, then Brian and I can have a conversation over email. He understands, you know, the importance of what I'm talking about in, in my particular you know, project area. So that's why I think it's really important to also have these, you know, walking audits and, and get Brian to go as well. Right. Or, yeah. or, or you can somebody. take pictures and video also true. of this if, if Brian yeah. isn't able to be everywhere. So yeah. And Monica, you were part of the Cedar Park Walk, right? Mm -hmm. Any tidbits that you would? I can do the Cedar Park Walk with you. Okay. Out of town. But okay. I've done it with some of the neighbors before and after that. The it's only the only other thing that comes to mind is that <laughs> the size of the group is important. So you don't want it to be too large that the that you end up splitting up, or um, people can't hear. That's mm -hmm. often an issue because you're walking on busy arterial streets. It's loud. It's noisy. Um, so five to eight people is a, is a really nice size. More than 10 gets a little unwieldy. And if you want to address the entire walk zone, uh, Jeff Lynn did this for the McDonald Elementary School, is you send, you get a group of 12 people and you send the, you know, three apiece off in mm -hmm. four different directions. So you can do that also yeah. as another kind of split up the, the whole walk zone. And then Kathy, when we did the, uh, Greenwood one, we had a bike group and a walking group that went, you know, determined the bike ways to go mm -hmm. and the walking group right. determined the walk. And know at the end that you want to come up, you know, with no more, I would say, than five high priorities. You don't want to come up with, it. yes, there are 25 big priorities, right. but choose five. And that's going to take some negotiation with your communities because. You know, it isn't everybody's walk and somebody might be coming from another part of the walk zone. So I think that that's important to... I think that's a really good tip. And the only thing that you might add beyond the five top projects or concerns is uh, uh, little stuff like vegetation and um, a sign is down or a sign has graffiti on it. And that stuff is easy, um, relatively easy to get fixed. Uh, if you report a sign down or um, malfunctioning traffic light, uh, SDOT's usually able to fix that really quickly. So if people had a $1,000 mini grant and they were going to put in, you know, do us an audit and put in five sets of, of crossing flags and then write up a report for you, how, how would, what would be the best way to kind of present information to you that would be most useful? Um, so. I would say to focus on short and sweet, um, but photos are always helpful. Um, and then it would be great if there were some consultation with me. So again, we don't end up with this, the example of the stop sign where you, you <coughs> run to the solution before we talk about the problem. So that would be super helpful if we could at least talk once throughout the process. Brian, I wonder if you could say a bit about those uh, curb cuts that, for, for people with mobility issues and people who, certain, especially people who depend on wheelchairs, they are so critically important. But I know that those are extremely expensive, and I. Uh, so how do you weigh the importance of, of having a, a route that is fully accessible for people who? Uh, have um, again, we primarily focus on um, the arterial crossings, or um, a lot of times we will also focus on those areas right adjacent to the school where we've got the highest volume of kids walking and biking. Um, they are, in addition to being helpful for uh, people with disabilities, they're also great for kids walking or walk kids biking because kids generally bike on the sidewalk and it's a lot easier to get up onto the sidewalk if there's a ramp. 
Um, but as Merlin mentioned, I'll just show you the picture again of what we have to do to meet the requirements of the ADA. So this was, again, at McDonald. This was a direct result of Jeff Lynn's um, audit report. And I think maybe his audit report is a little over the top. It's yeah, almost it's, a little yeah, he got an easy report. <laughs> it's a little overwhelming. I don't even know how we have time to do it. But um, uh, the sidewalk had to be replaced clear back to here because this, it was cracked and it wasn't even. And you have to provide a level landing at the top of the ramp. Um, and then you have to provide two ramps, one going this way and one going that way. Um, so it's a, it's not a small undertaking. It's not like you see examples of um, 20 years ago where we just cut and then put a ramp in. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, the, the next picture over. Yep. So that precise intersection, I mean, it's got a crosswalk. It's got a stop. It's, it's got a stop. It's got a four-way stop. But cars don't actually do the full stop. They just mm -hmm. go through. Yep not seeing their pedestrians nearby. So um, the flags, uh, is it hard? I think you already mentioned this, but I don't want to hear it again. Yeah, sure. <laughs> how, how do we get the flags? You don't have to have a permit. You don't have to ask our permission. Mm, okay. You just have to buy the flags. Orange or yellow is generally most effective. Well, like, is I could go to Seattle Fabrics and get some fabric and Perfect. go and get a PVC right. pipe. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. I mean, I'm thinking... We're in the same neighborhood on the same yeah. project. Yeah. Um, like, that's been going through my head of like, okay, well, that's an easy, that's oh, a super yeah. easy fix. Yep. Oh, we should probably. But I'm trying not to get specific. That's the only crosswalk in our neighborhood. No, they can be. No, I mean, literally, that is the only painted crosswalk <laughs> in the school zone. No, no, and I'm saying they can be an unpainted. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, but how do you, there's no, nothing to fix the, the flags to. Yeah, you can you can strap them onto a pole, or you yeah. can. So you've got the street name sign over yeah. here. You can put it on the street name so sign. Zip ties. Zip ties or the metal. I'm I'm on it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Is that legal, though? I mean, you're, yeah. isn't somebody going to come out and say, "Hey, knock no. it off"? No. It's uh, there's a director's rule. If SDOT has officially said we will allow this. Okay. Awesome. And we can use the mini grant. Yes. Well, yeah. like, yeah, they might get ripped <laughs> off, but it's not. It, I'm not going to get arrested or fined. Yes, thank you. For yeah. That so wait, one more thing, important thing. It has to be at a legal crosswalk, so it doesn't have to be marked, but it has to be an actual crossing. So there was an example recently where some helpful people put one in a mid block where there's not a crosswalk, and it have, that has to go. Um, but Every intersection is every intersection is a legal crossing. Okay. Or wherever there's a curb cut, isn't that correct? We only put curb cuts at legal crossings. But it can be at a T. Yes, yeah. T intersections are still legal crossings. Can I make a quick res response to Susie? Um, somebody in my neighborhood went to Seattle Fabrics, got some of the day glow stuff. It's already faded after two months. Oh really? So, okay. Yeah. We have a sweet so, reflective vacuum ripstop nylon taffeta that's been in the, re the remnant bin though lately. Okay. <laughs> and I mean like day glow blinds you, yeah, but yeah. sparkly, and okay. that's pretty sweet. Okay. Okay. And I was wondering, and I wanted to see if anybody else here was gonna would be would be able to brainstorm about it, about leveraging things like parking day, and um, like this month this walk and wheel October. At least at our school, we call it walk and wheel October. Um, where the kids, um, we have an awesome in-house bicycle unit, uh, which we've augmented with the mini grant. Um, we have generally over 150 unicyclers for the wow. Sudanai parade, like every year minimum. Um, and we did 165 bikers to school. So it's inclusive. But leveraging those two days and maybe other ones on the calendar with supports outside of the school, not just the parents or the students, for doing like the tactical urbanism to encourage, because we, Whittier, and I get it, we're not an arterial. We're stuck with the one ways. Um, we are something, a mini, a mini magnet school where we have a program that's going to be ending, but people drive from everywhere else to get there, um, and they drive at the last minute, and they're in the bus zone where we have kids trying to go <coughs> down one street that's wide. So what we wanted to do um, to solve that is to do some sort of tactical urbanism thing and use like the spray chalk 
Oh yeah. Which is temporary. Yep. Cool. I just did yes. Um, <laughs> um, and to, like do stuff like that. Is there a way where we could leverage a group of people to staff those for most of the day for parking day? Maybe for next year, or or does it have to be staffed all day, um, or is it like on walk to school day? We can do a push every year because it's at the beginning where people need to be reminded and set in patterns. Did you what, did let you me get an answer from Ashley yet? A little bit on parking day. Uh, we wait till next year, and then about my chalk paint. The yeah. chalk paint is a yes. So chalk paint is a yes. You just have to show it to us to make sure that you're... <laughs> <laughs> Actually, <laughs> chalk paint. Yeah, but I mean, I was like, you shouldn't have told me what you were going to do. Yeah, we just don't want to make sure that there are, uh, that the messages are... Because we've been doing the increased awareness. We're almost at the point of taking the picture of the same BMW and Porsche Silver Targa top <laughs> that come up into the bus zone every morning and drop their kids off. Um, just smiling a smile and take a picture. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Yes, the teachers are out there waving this is a bus zone and talking to them and they've yelled at them to leave them alone. It happens, every, it's not just these guys. This is every year. There are parents yelling at staff members to go away and that they're late mm -hmm. and they have to drop them off here. I was wondering if the two people who did uh, parking, we did four parking days at Seattle neighborhood green ones, but yeah. two of these guys did fantastic ones. Kenneth and Chris, could you just like talk about your project? Sure. Um, so I did a, I'm Chris, um, I did a project at the intersection of 6th and 65th, um, mm -hmm. right next to Molly McGuire's in the sneakery. Um, and what we did is, so 6 is a future neighborhood greenway, and the challenge is, is that the street isn't aligned, so you have to jog on the 60 show. So we did a couple of different things, and one, the, the big one, the two big moves is that we essentially created a protected bike lane on uh, for parkways, it was there on the both sides of the street, but on, um, technically for parking day, it was just on the north side of the street, showing how you're coming southbound on 6th, that you tuck into a protected bike lane. And then when you align with 6 going on um, the south side of 65th, SDOT helped us put in a crosswalk in front of Molly McGuire's. And so we were able to put down tape for, the, for two days and demonstrate how we were delineating the space for a protected bike lane, a crosswalk, and then in that crosswalk, I did a little DIY curb ramp. And so putting all the pieces together to kind of illustrate how to facilitate a safe crossing for people walking and for people on bikes. Because they're kind of two different things, different, different facilities. Um, with that project, uh, a lot of folks, there were some folks in the, uh, Jamie and Selena, um, helped put that together. And we got a lot of great feedback from the business community, as well as people kind of utilizing it. Um, and that's kind of, I think, uh, started some conversations about curb ramps and what are <laughs> other temp types of temporary kind of solutions, a la Pioneer Square asphalt shims, for expensive mm -hmm. solutions. Like, well, we got around it there. How else can we get around it? Like, and I think it's the ADA. It's the ADA that's restrictive. So it's the legal, it's the liability side that's got us back into a corner. But there seems to be some little wiggle room and what is it, where is it, that we can kind of get to these more kind of ad hoc, these kind of installations that can be um, done for one day temporary solutions or asphalt shim is going to last, what, a year and redo it. So. And Kenneth, Kenneth, you want to talk about your, your question? Um, sure. Do we have chalk? Maybe users just draw it. Yeah. <laughs> That's um, a lot of chalk. Right? Okay. Yeah. So. I don't know if you guys know where the Burke and the Trail crosses 40th Avenue Northeast. By Metro Market. By Metro Market. So, oh, yeah. Children. Thank like you. Let's yeah. say that this is the Burke. <laughs> like, I'm in Ballard. And this, yeah. this is 40th. So the Burke crosses this way. Um, this street has parking lanes as well as two travel lanes. Uh, but uh, SDOT has signs up saying it's actually illegal to park within a certain number of feet of the mm -hmm. bike crossing, right? So we just created temporary curb bulbs in that space. It looks like we're taking away parking, but we actually didn't take away a single legal parking spot. Um, we did this with orange cones, and people were slowing down so much they were coming to a stop wondering what was going on. I mean, part of this is because we have orange stuff and people think there's 
construction or something like that. But um, this shortened the crossing distance by about 40%. Um, and it allows you to get out here so you can really see down the street and people on the street can see you and you're still protected. Mm -hmm. um, so we had, I mean, because it's the Brooklyn Trail, we had hundreds of users because of this the morning and evening commute. Um, and I don't think we got a single negative comment. I think one car slid down and yelled something, but we couldn't make out what it was. <laughs> um, but I mean, the, the fact is we weren't actually encountering cars so much, we were just talking to bikers and walkers as they went by. Um, but like this is, you know, this took 15 minutes to build. Literally, we were done by 7.15, and we just have it launched. Kind of I think it would be great to do, because like, I saw both of those projects, to that sort of stuff at the schools that are either coming up, uh, up on the priority list, like near arterials, and um, the free and reduced or minority communities, I can't remember what the metric is, but they're for those of us who aren't going to get to that, and I understand the equity, that makes total sense, but for those of us who still have problems and kids are nearly getting swiped, it would be neat to be able to do that. Um, too. And the cool thing about parking day, which I realized at like 10.30 in the morning on parking day, was it's the third Friday of, of September and school, especially this year, just started. And we can totally like get some, you know, temporary chalk paint. I mean, not temporary in quotes, but that chalk paint can last <laughs> quite some time um, out there in September. <laughs> you know, with just yeah, and to help enforce habits and get people to move their commute somewhere else mm -hmm. because they spaced it off all summer. So I just I just wanted to mention too, we did we're assisted with four parking day projects around that are you know very big kind of tactical urbanism projects, and one was two thousand feet of protected bike lane on Rainier Avenue South. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so yeah, it's written up in our kind of newsletter, but you know it's. It's possible to do these things, and I think really excellent to do these things because that, then you can see what local businesses feel about you know what you're doing. You know, yeah. I mean, they, they change their minds. People change their minds when they actually see something. Yeah. Well, the, 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 the manager of Metro Market didn't understand what we were talking about. I thought we were talking about blocking out 40th, and he finally came out and saw it. He was like, "Oh." Oh, this is great. Thanks. Wow. <laughs> I mean, he, he was upset, and then he saw it and, and just totally understood. Yeah. Right. Um, that idea of using police streets, is that an option for a school or a, does it have to be an individual or a neighbor? You have to get a permit and there's some um, guidelines that you have to follow. You can't close a bus route or an arterial street, I think, and it can only be one block. You can't block off the whole intersection. And I can't remember all the other guidelines. I can, but if you're interested, I can send you um, information. And yes, absolutely, it's possible. You have to you have to notify the neighbors to make sure that you're not going to end up with the real cranky person. But can a school put an application in for that? Yeah, that's, absolutely. The photo that I showed there was um, Saint Therese. Yeah. So they have their um, their playground is on this side of the streets. And their school is on this side of the street. And the kids have to cross mid-block. There's no crosswalk all day and all night. So, um, so you could also put a demonstration project in as part of that. Yeah, yeah. You know, just to show that wasn't people here were truly St. Alphonse's on yeah. 58th between 14th and 15th mm -hmm. has done it for uh, years. Years. So it's on a regular basis. Every day. It is every day? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Every yeah. Yeah. yeah, there are specific that's hours. That that's the next level above Play Street. Yeah. So Play Street, again, I can't remember all the uh, applications or, or all the guidelines. Mm -hmm. but it's a similar situation where their playground is on one mm -hmm. side and school is on the mm -hmm. other. There's actually five schools that do it. There's Our Lady of Guadalupe in West Seattle, Holy Family in West Seattle, um, St. Alphonsus. There's two more. I can't remember. But... Um, mm -hmm. There is a permit, so like you have to apply for it and get approval for it, but it is a possibility. Um, it's probably not a possibility if you um, have a, more than a couple of neighbors, because who's going to want not to not have access to house. their driveway? Um, but I mean, I'm thinking even in a situation where you wanted to try to put in a demo or something like that to show. Sure. Play Streets is probably the best tool. Oh yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. We have to work. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, well, hold on. Gail's had a question. Yeah, thank you. So, um, I'm, rather than asking about the what I think is the solution, I'll, I'll describe the problem. So, a very narrow street that is a, it's one of the crosswalks that the kids go out and do the crossing guards on. And it's a very narrow street. 
you got a lot of people coming from one direction and a lot of people trying to go the other direction, and, what en and it's also on a steep hill. And so what ends up happening is that people kind of come head to head. They can't cross. There's a lot of parking on the sides, and so then somebody backs up downhill across the crosswalk that all the kids are crossing, coming across almost every day. Um, what would, what about changing directions of streets or asking people not to drive there? What other options would there be besides? Yeah, that sounds like a really bad situation. Um, so when I send out the arrival and dismissal um, handbook, I think that might help a lot. But basically, I think what a lot of schools have done is use sandwich boards, which I, you're talking about West Woodland? Yeah. Yeah, which I think you have sandwich boards to some extent. Yeah. But um, reinforcing that traffic circulation pattern. We generally don't make one-way streets around schools because the traffic chaos happens for 15 minutes in the morning and maybe 20 minutes in the afternoon and to, to create 24-7 one-way streets um, is not something that we generally do. It also tends to make people drive faster, which is an unintended consequence that we don't want to have happen around schools. So we generally like the two-way operation, even with the narrow streets. But there are other things that you can do, like especially with your traffic circulation plan, to get parents and neighbors to buy into that one-way circulation. So if you put up a sign that says "Don't drive there," it wouldn't. It, no one would get a ticket, but maybe no people would, would just get a ticket. To. And you probably want to use words like "West Woodland parents drive this way" or something like that, so it doesn't apply to the general public because the last thing you want is for someone to call and complain. <laughs> okay. I have three questions. They are generic, but I've been saving them throughout. Um, first question is, can we increase the hours of the traffic cameras? Or can we change them? Or for streets where it's not just a, a safety issue, when the kid, I mean, it's a safety issue when kids are going to school, but it's just always, people are always going 10 to 15 over the speed limit. We can change the hours. There's a, we're trying to make it standard throughout the, the city, but I'll give you an example of when we did change it. There was a crosswalk where we had it timed for a middle school, and through, through our outreach process, we found out elementary school students used the same crosswalk. And so we extended the hours to cover the both of the school arrival and dismissals. Okay. Um, but in general, we like to keep it approximately 45 to 50 minutes in the morning and then 45 to 50 minutes in the afternoon, just sure. when kids are going to be expected to be there. Can it be added in the summertime? Because that's actually when we have more foot traffic. We're in, so North Acres Park has the spray park, which is crazy busy. And then at the other end of First Avenue, four blocks away, we have Northgate Elementary School. Okay. But in the summertime, there's no accountability other than, I don't know if I've sent you the picture, but there's a picture of my daughter standing three inches from the road in a car hauling by. Oh, wow. Um, so I just, and it, right, there's no people parking illegally, all sorts of good stuff. Yeah. Um, Maybe. Okay. Maybe. Okay. Okay. Um, how can I keep track of upcoming capital projects? I feel like there are so many things that I I'm can't supposed even to keep up with them. Like, because so. you mentioned, like, if you keep on track and you keep on top of it, then you can encourage them when they're coming up with this thing right. to do X. And how it's am I it's supposed overwhelming. to do it? It's I mean, yeah. I, I think people who do it all the time probably agree. It's really hard to keep up with, and there's no central database to go to. There's no like yeah. wizard of S dot to go sure. get a list of all projects. We're working on it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Be good. Okay. Um, and if all of if all of your streets are deemed arterials, can you actually do anything? Yeah, absolutely. We can okay. we can use some of the same tools on arterials that we okay. can on the non arterials. So we can use they're called speed cushions instead of okay. speed bumps, but they basically have the same they have very similar effects. Okay. They're not quite as effective, but they're very effective. Okay. Um, we can do use the radar speed feedback signs. Okay that say your speed is and speed limit. We can, uh, I hate to even throw this out there, but I will, we can lower the speed limit. Yeah. Um, and this is a good time to talk about this. Right, speed. exactly. This can go up in all school zones. Yes. 
Mm -hmm. can go up and also I have, so I have one of those signs for you, by the way. Right. It can, it can go up yeah, yeah, yeah. on a, I just, any neighborhood on my porch. greenway. It could also, we actually now have, I think, five 20 mile an hour zones that aren't, aren't related to um, neighborhood greenways or, or schools. There's um, one in Lake City. Um, so I would encourage people to keep these signs in the areas where the speed limit is 20. Can you go on potential greenways, ones that are supposed to be greenways I, but aren't I am yet? not going to, and I don't think anyone He's is going to, police, <laughs> but I would encourage people to keep them to areas where it's 20. Um, where it's signed. Yeah. Which is all school zones. All, all school zones, all neighborhood greenways, and then those um, five areas that are probably going to grow next year. Yes. Um, I don't know how much. What happens if the move Seattle levy does not pass? No. Nobody knows. <laughs> so, so I will still have money in my program, that's true. Brian will be but that 150 <laughs> blocks of sidewalks. <laughs> just won't have the I'll lose down. about 20% of the funding for my program if the levy doesn't pass. Um, what about lobbying or getting our legislators to ask to install the speed cameras at a really dangerous intersections that are are on state routes, for example, like on 99 and 90th, where Lee's talking about. Um, and I, there's a couple, there's a speed camera program, right, where they had like a pilot. Yes. Right? Yep. And just a little back, background. Um, Holman Road is the same thing, so we were lusting mm -hmm. after the opportunity <laughs> to have a pilot speed camera. Um, and Lee and I had talked about this too, and, and Robin, I think, as well, about getting one of those you know, cameras reinstated and putting it on Aurora. Is that a possibility, and what could we do? If These are all great ideas, and uh, I'll just reiterate in case someone didn't hear that the state legislature gave us the authority to use the speed cameras, and they limited it to just school zones and I think maybe construction zones. <laughs> Outside of those two areas, where we have no authority to install <coughs> cameras. If you want that to change, you should contact your state representatives. Does the state define what is a school zone? Yes. What's the definition? That perhaps should change. Hmm. What's that? What's the definition of a school zone? It's generally 300 feet from a school property boundary or a school crosswalk. Is those cameras that, that give out tickets for speeding when the lights are flashing in a school zone? Yes. Mm -hmm. Can they be programmed? I'm coming back to your question, Susan. Can they be programmed so that when the lights aren't flashing, if the speed is detected at over 30 miles per hour, the person also gets ticketed? I think that would require change to state law. Because again, we're only allowed to enforce the mm -hmm. school speed limit, not the ordinary speed limit. Thank you. Um, one other question. Yep. You mentioned that the, the prioritization changes every year because Seattle Public Schools are opening different schools right. and schools, and certainly there's some happening. Is there any funding that comes from Seattle Public Schools when they're building a new school to commit to making the sidewalks more accessible or the routes more accessible, or are they only responsible for right in front of the school? The they're only front responsible front? for the adjacent uh, frontage. Okay. They don't spend any money other than the adult crossing guard program which is great mm -hmm. but that's the only that's the only way they touch um, the walking routes as kids are walking and biking to school Brian you had some other handouts that I want to make sure people get if anybody's good good mm -hmm. reminder so um, let's see this is um, a guide to starting a safe routes to school campaign at your school it's basically mm -hmm. it, starts off from the assumption that you haven't done one of these before, and a lot of you probably have, but it, it provides a lot of really good resources. Um, I can provide that to you electronically as well if you want to distribute it to others. Then this is the engineering toolkit, and this outlines basically all of the engineering um, tools that we have available, crosswalks, signals, um, sidewalks, what they cost, um, where we put them, how we prioritize them. And I'll be providing all of these electronically. If you've signed up on the site, sign in sheet, I don't know where that is. And 
We'll put them on our website. Can you pass it that way, Ken? This is walkability and bikeability checklist, so you can use this as your starting point. Um, it's a little overwhelming because it's like the walkability checklist is four pages, the bikeability checklist <laughs> is six pages. You don't have to fill out every little thing on the checklist. Um, if you want to just focus on the things that are most pertinent to you and you can re reproduce that. Yeah, it's from the uh, Safe Routes to School Center, so it's pretty comprehensive. And then the last thing is that this is the list of prioritized schools. So we've got on one side is schools ranked for walkway projects, mm -hmm. uh, sidewalks, and then the list of schools and where they rank on the back, and then crossing. So there's two sheets, but they're collated. So hopefully that doesn't cause too much confusion. I'm going to pass around this little teeny little thing. This is traffic safety in a box. And this is just a program that your colleague puts puts on, uh, Allison, um, to do very elementary teaching children how to look left and right, how to use a bike box, what, what uh, crosswalk is. Because it's surprising. We don't teach that to our kids. Uh, yeah, collated. So take as two. As yeah, I mean, we do if we're walking around with them, but but it's also. I mean, we we run this program a couple of times, and it's surprising what the adults don't know. Yeah. Too. So, so I'm just going to pass around. This is just an example of that program. One last quick question: uh, Do you get money for parking tickets too, or just speeding? Tickets? No, just speeding tickets. How would you go about getting uh, parking enforcement out to? To some regularly bad parking Good question. Areas. There's a there's a number to call. Okay. You should be able to Google it very fairly okay. easily if you do Seattle Parking Enforcement request. If you have a hard time, contact me and I'll actually I'll just tell you now. You call the non emergency police line and then you have to dial a bunch of numbers. It's some combination of eights and twos. <laughs> <laughs> when, so when you see somebody parked, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you have to, yeah, you see when you see there's a car, or you can get the find it fix it app and take a picture of the license plate. I've tried that. I don't know if they actually get a ticket. But so I, I there the city is divided I think into three regions, and each region region has two parking enforcement officer leads. And I have their names, and so I could actually shortcut that and just. So we're we'll, we'll only getting a whole resource. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Pass along. Yeah. Uh, one thing yeah. issue that oh, I has to do with long range planning. I remember hearing that when some of these schools, and I don't remember which ones, were designed, that they're basically designed to create traffic jams of thousands and thousands of parents dropping kids off. And oh, I think. I think there should be room for uh, citizen, neighbor, parent input at the point when schools are being, school buildings and school grounds are being designed to say, wait a minute, we need this to be, to mm -hmm. prioritize kids walking and biking to school, uh, to have places for kids to safely walk up to the front door and not have the front door blocked off by streams and streams of cars and a gigantic parking lot. That's what the Wilson Pacific folks are trying to do. Yeah, that's right. the goal right now. That's a, yeah, that's, as, and I don't mean to sound jaded, but as one but as parent of a, only a third grader who's trying to get help for health issues and Seattle Public Schools engagement plan, I've heard the other districts do a great job of having parents and community members conflict commenting about the plans and the traffic. And I've been reading, so I'm on that email list for what's going on at Wilson Pacific, and that seems far from my course, or actually a little bit better than what I've run into for STS and parents. Can we let like, Lee, Lee talk just because yeah. we um, Wilson Pacific's a good example. The city of Seattle just does not um, require developers or the school district yeah, anyway. to do any public improvements around the school or the development. Um, whether they should or not is something that should be taken up with council probably. Um, but as an example, um, they're going to put in normal sidewalks around Wilson Pacific, but absolutely do nothing about the um, about the streets and the traffic. The SDA or uh, DPD in their permit um, said that there were about I don't know, for, uh, there were nine plus or minus um, 
things that should get taken care of. That will be taken care of later by SDOT and by the School Traffic Safety Committee. And they, they left the schools completely off the hook. I, I got two comments that are both new ideas. I don't know how far along we can get them going. But one comment I want to make, since you mentioned childhood issues. And so the, I have relatives in Belgium. And one of the things that the federal government of Belgium has done is that they offer people five cents per kilometer to, for every kilometer they ride to work. And this is for all people in the country of Belgium. <laughs> So I was thinking, you know, is it even possible for you to start a program where you give kids an incentive to ride to school? I mean, it doesn't have to be money. Yeah. Like, just something to encourage kids to want to ride to school, not just get the parents off the streets, right? Yeah. You don't have to replace the problem with the school. I think that's a great idea, and that would be a great use of uh, mini grant. Mm -hmm. Oh, so is that how the media come up Yeah. With? Okay. I did. Absolutely. I did group snacks <laughs> to augment mm -hmm. cascades um, by the school month that came through with like nuts and stuff in it and so I went out and I used my mini grant to buy something that looked like it had no gluten and no um, <laughs> and no um, dairy and no nuts in it whatsoever and so we had over 160 kids and everybody got something. Yeah. So, okay. That worked great. Second question I have is, so you know, I know by now that I'm very concerned about the arterial street problem um, and I know that we can't have speed or speed humps. I, you can. But, oh, but it's expensive. And it's not expensive. But anyway, I didn't get them <laughs> uh -oh. in my last, well, I wrote that grant and oh, that, right, uh, right, 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 right. I wrote a grant saying we need to slow cars down and then the grant got rejected even though it was the highest priority in the entire the district council. Uh -huh. yeah. um, so I was just wondering, so that answers the first question. That's possible. The other thing I was thinking of is it is it more expensive or less expensive to do, um, you know, something I've seen in larger streets is they put the little you know the yellow turtles. They make a speed bump width out of the turtles so yeah. that emergency vehicles can just pass through those. Yeah. Is that is that an option you can do with safe roads to school or? We try to stay away from the big turtles like. The ones I think that you're thinking of. No, no, I'm thinking this. The little turtles, yes. The little turtles, they're the little buttons. We use them essentially um, on the center lines so that if you veer out of your lane, you get kind of some feedback uh -huh. and mm -hmm. helps keep drivers in their lane. But I, think, but I think there are better mm -hmm. traffic calming tools, including the speed cushions, and I think that we just need to work together. And I know that's a little frustrating of an answer, but. Um, to figure well, how, out what the I, next step how is. How do I get a cold Because I've been trying all year. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, that's challenging to do. Yeah. He's got two no, years to do. No, I so, understand that. that you <laughs> before know, he leaves, he gets me on the camera. I get that. Um, let's just continue talking and hopefully we'll come up with something. Okay. Um, before I apply for the next one? Well, I think you should definitely apply for this one simple. Oh, I am, yeah. but I would love to have you knowing what I'm doing instead of just rejecting everything I'm throwing at this thought. So, it was the council, please. Not yes. And I'm, I'm going to let, let, I mean, you've been talking for an hour and a half. If we do have snacks back there. I do want to get rid of these signs. We have to be out of here at 8. Oh. Oh. Uh, so we have a two-hour reservation? Yeah, yeah, I don't think they'll be overly upset. Okay, so we can stay a little bit. But, but yeah, he needs stuff. <laughs> also, the, the St. Francis School mini grants are due at the end of October, and you need to talk with your school's principal to get that lined up and have them approve it. So now is the perfect time to be thinking about getting a mini grant.